grace and peace, and welcome to our podcast, Your Week at St. Luke's. Today, we begin a new series for Advent 2021 called God's Story Delivered. And Advent is the first season of the Christian year, and it is a season m- much like Lent in that it is a season of preparation. Advent prepares us for the coming of Christ at Christmas. And so for the next four weeks, as we journey closer towards Christmas, we're going to be reading about and thinking about figures in the Bible who deliver God's story in powerful and impactful ways. We're going to be looking at Sarah in Genesis, the midwives, uh, Shipra and uh, Pura in Exodus, and then Mary in the Gospel of Luke. But today, uh, today we start off in the beginning the very beginning, and Genesis with Eve. And so now in the past, uh, we have had biblical scholars, uh, people with PhDs in the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, uh, people who have spent a lot of time in the text, reading, learning, in the original language, and all of that kind of amazing stuff. This series is is us St. Luke's pastors. Uh, we, will have, we, ha- we all have master's degrees in divinity, uh, and while we've all studied uh, languages of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, we are not to that caliber of those uh, who have lectured before. So give us some grace. Um, we've done the best studying we can, most faithful studying, uh, to present this to you. Uh, and then afterwards, our after-hours conversation is the four of us pastors kind of just uh, having conversation about these figures, about these texts. And so we hope it'll be an enriching time for you. Um, as we think about uh, all of these four people, these, these four Sundays getting us closer to Christmas. Okay, so Eve. Eve may be the best known woman in the Hebrew Bible. The story of Eve is, is particularly found in, in Genesis 2 through 4, and, and more specifically, she's named only in 4. Uh, and she's had an enormous influence on women's lives and, and, and the roles of women for thousands of years. She's the, the, the first woman, according to the biblical story, and, and Eve represents all women. Uh, she is uh, the, a mother and the mother of all living things, as it says in the, the biblical narrative. Now, these creation stories, uh, the stories of Eve, they've been used throughout history, both to blame women for the orig- origin of sin and to give women a a lower status than men. Eve has been called a a sinner or the original sinner because she ate from the forbidden fruit. She's been considered a seductress because she gave Adam the fruit and seduced him um, into eating it. And she is considered a, a secondary and subordinate character to man. Eve is depicted negatively But biblical scholarship of recent years has reclaimed her as an archetypal figure who represents the social and economic roles of of Israelite women, and they've helped recover who Eve actually is in the text and, and redeem Eve's place in our story. A close look at the language portrayed uh, portraying the creation of the first couple and their disobedience in, in Eden, uh, along with God's mandate for life outside the garden, reveals Eve's partnership with Adam, Adam, the, the first man, and her contributions to what will become family life, her motherhood, notably in bearing and naming her, her first child, Cain, has her participating with God in the creative act of maternity. So these, these negative labels, these, these views, these stereotypes are actually not in the biblical story itself. These negative perceptions are the result of later translations and interpretations that are more so based around the structures of power and coercion than they are in the, the Hebrew text itself. These later interpretations come from contexts that are very different from the Iron Age that these, these texts originated from, or around the, 
1200 to 600 BCE, where the society of the Israelites, they, they, they convey ideas that, that don't really, we understand more fully, and, but they conveyed ideas that resonated with them there in their culture. And so a, a closer look at the biblical tale itself, even in our English translation, shows, for example, that the misdeed of the first humans, it's actually never called a sin. That word's never used in, in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that the first woman hands the first man uh, uh, this piece of fruit. She doesn't seduce or, or tempt him. It reads as if actually he is right there next to her as the conversation is happening. He's experiencing it all with her all along the same time. So we want to, to first be faithful to the text. And in doing so, I think we can reclaim Eve's place uh, a positive contribution to delivering God's story. So let's first talk uh, briefly about original sin. Uh, rabbi um, K, David K, is uh, just recently retired. He's a rabbi here in Central Florida, and uh, he came to speak to a group of our confirmands. Um, and, and one of the things he shared with them is that Jewish people have no concept of original sin. It's all ours. It's all us Christians that came up with the idea. It was Augustine, actually, uh, in the second century who came up with his idea of original sin and, and blamed Adam and Eve for all the woes of our world. And Rabbi Kay is saying that as Hebrew people, we don't see it that way. We don't blame Adam or Eve for the sin of our lives and the sins of this world. And so to be more faithful to the text and the groups of people who brought it about, well, they didn't look at it that way. I'd like to propose, though, that uh, what we have with Eve is we have the first human to express free will. She has the freedom to make a choice. God has given that to Adam and Eve in the garden to, to choose to eat from this and disobey or to not eat from this. And she exercises that free will. And Adam quickly follows I think we all are people who want to exercise our free will as faithful as we possibly can, to have the freedom to, to, to choose which path we will take and how we will live our lives. Eve seems to be a person of strength who's willing to do that. Makes a mistake, yes, but she expresses free will and is the first person in Scripture to do so. She expresses and exercises free will, the freedom within her to make her own choices. So let's then spend some time thinking about these texts. In the first creation story, Genesis chapter 1, uh, and in verse uh, 27, humanity then is created. Now, in, in the written Torah, there are two creation stories that are given for human life, for all of the world, the cosmos. And Genesis is usually seen as a, a composite work drawn up from various sources and edited over uh, the course of many centuries. Uh, there are four author groups um, that we can see when we look at Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And those four author groups are called J, E, D, and P. J is for the Yahwist, who, who use the word Yahweh uh, when they speak of God. E is for the Elohist, who use uh, Elohim most frequently when they speak about God. D is for the Deuteronomist, uh, who specifically are really narrowed into Deuteronomy. Uh, and then P is the priestly material. It seems to be more poetic and um, has more of a cultic or a worship practice nature within it. And Genesis 1 through 11 are primarily made up of J, the Yahwist, and P, uh, the priestly author. And in chapter 1 and 2, they are seen right next to each other as a, as a piece of work from the priest and the Yahwist traditions. One seems to be coming, chap, chapter 1 seems to be coming from the priestly author group, and, and chapter 2 seems to be coming from the Yahwist or, or the J. So, anyways, uh, in the first chapter, uh, she, Eve, is created alongside Adam at the same time. I'm going to quote from the, the Jewish uh, 
Publication Society's translation. Uh, Genesis 1, 27. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So here we have humanity is created both male and female, just like the rest of creation. We have male giraffes and we have female giraffes. Humankind is created in God's image equally, at least according to the priestly tradition and storytelling of creation. And so Eve, right away, female, is seen co-equal with man. There's no difference. Well, the second creation story that comes from the Yaoist, uh, we have Eve, or the, the female, created from Adam, or the male's side, when he is in a deep sleep. Again, I'm going to read from the Jewish uh, Publication Society of the Tanakh. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that spot. And the Lord God fashioned the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. That's chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. A few interesting things to point out as we dive a little bit further into Eve. The first is the name that's given to the man, Adama. Uh, Adama, or Adam, literally means human, ground, earth. And so God creates human. Ev, the female, is Shehev or Hachashev. It just depends on how good you are at Hebrew. I'm not. It means uh, the living or life. And so one way of looking at this creation story is saying God's created human life. And that God earlier says, I, I, you're not complete, Adam. You're not complete. And you are human, but you're not alive. And you're not alive until we've created Eve. We've created this female for you. There, there's a great rabbinic story about the creation story that, that says that, uh, that there's the movement and the pattern of creation, that God creates the aardvark. It's got a weird name, but it's good. God creates the tree, and it's good. God creates birds in the air, and it's good. God creates man, steps back, and says, you know what? I think I can do better, and God creates woman. Well, aside from the joke, there's a lot more that's actually happening here that the ancient rabbis talk about that if woman were to be underneath the foot of man, would God not have taken a bone from the foot of Adam? But no, certainly not. God created Eve, human life, the female, from the side of Adam, that the two would be co-equal side by side, not under the foot, but co-equal. Another interesting point here in in, in fact, in Acts, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 23, Adam says, Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Well, there's a, there's a literal meaning there, right? Um, she's taken from the bone. It's also an expression that has figurative meaning uh, for persons belonging one to another. There is still in this ancient reading, this ancient understanding that Eve is co-equal with Adam. There's an equal playing field for the two of them. And so I think we can understand Eve in this way as, as a person of strength and creativity and importance. Another piece that's interesting in, in the second creation story is that God says uh, to Adam, I need to make you uh, an easer, easer. Uh, a, a helper, oftentimes is what it's translated as. And so Eve is a helper, subservient to Adam, a man. And, and this word Ezer we've heard before, all throughout the Hebrew Bible, we have this reference to uh, Ebenezer, right? Ebenezer is a stone of strength, stone of help. Uh, rock and stone, my, my, you are my rock, my stone, my Ebenezer, O God. And a reference mainly to who God is. Well, the Jewish Publication Society translates, translates it really well. Instead of helper, it says a fitting helper. 
But I really prefer how Richard Elliot Friedman and, and his translation of the Torah uh, says it directly from the Hebrew. Uh, Genesis 2, chapter 18. And Yahweh God said, It's not good for the human to be by himself. I'll make for him a strength corresponding to him. A strength corresponding to him. Eve is a strength. She's the second human on earth, but she is second to no one. She's the first woman, and she provides such strength in our narrative as she brings about life. And that's the next piece we want to look at. How Eve is a mother who co-creates with God in Genesis 4 as she brings to life their firstborn child, Cain, and then Abel, and then uh, a little later on, Seth is born. It's also interesting and important to note that the first person to pronounce the name of God in the Bible is Eve. Adam, Cain, Abel, Seth, they are never quoted as saying the name of God. But Eve, as she brings life into this world, recognizes that she is co-creating with God, and she speaks his holy, intimate, God's holy, intimate name. And the other men do not. So we've dismantled, I hope, some of the myths and misinterpretations of Eve. Um, she's not the originator of sin. But she is, for me, most definitely the originator of free will. She's not someone who is helping further humanity in a sinful nature and way. You know, she's just part of what it means to be human life and live. And she co-creates with God, helping bring birth and life into the story, the story of God. She delivers the story of God as it begins for all of us. And she does so as a strength, a strength corresponding to all other strengths. Well, I look forward to the discussion that uh, we'll have together um, in Bible studies um, and even in our um, after hours conversation. Grace and peace, friends. Welcome to This Week at St. Luke's, our Advent office hours time together. Um, for this series, we are going to be just conversing as pastors and talking about the scriptures and um, what those scriptures have to do with our Advent words. Advent is a time, much like Lent, of preparation where we prepare for um, the incarnation to of Jesus to be born into our lives, but not just the first birth, but the birthing of Jesus again in the kingdom of God. Um, and it's a time of spiritual examination, of looking at our lives and looking at our um, ourselves more seriously and our relationship with God. And this particular Advent, we're having the culmination of this idea of the stories we live, that we've been um, living into throughout 2021, as we realize that from beginning to end of Scripture, God has been delivering a story of love, um, of love to humanity, and that even when the world tries to thwart that story or ends that story, God finds people, and in particular women, who are willing to do whatever it takes to continue God's story until we get to God's revelation of love in the incarnation. And so we're going to be talking about some beautiful women from Genesis all the way up until um, the Gospel of Luke. And we hope that in this time you find your own sense of love and joy and peace and hope this Advent season. So let's kick us off with who is Eve? We're going to start right in the beginning of Genesis. Got to start from the beginning, right? You gotta, you know, we're going to do this thing. So Eve, Eve is um, here in Genesis 2, finally gets named um, in the two creation stories. Um, yeah, she's the 
the mother of the first mother, right? the mother of Cain and Abel and Seth, the first sons. Yeah, I think there's there's so much around the character of Eve. There's mythology around the character of Eve. There's what we we read in scripture, but there's also um, a lot around who Eve is in in. Um, uh, more just sort of common, you know, what you have in the back of your head about that. The the way that she's talked about is not always necessarily what you actually find about her in scripture too. So I think that's something to, to play with is, is looking at um, who Eve really is and who we really see um, Eve being in scripture as well. And you get, Eve gets a lot of the blame mm-hmm. in our faith and in, in religion. In some um, cases, all of it. Yeah, really, truly, all of it. Original sin, and and if it hadn't been for Eve, this wouldn't happen, and that wouldn't happen, and especially in um, people uh, face that believe in total depravity, mm-hmm. that Eve mm-hmm. erased the image of God, which we as Methodists do not believe. Right, right. right. we do not believe that. Um, we believe the image of God is still in us, um, which is a shame because Eve is really one of the image bearers of God and is birthing that that connection. So let's talk about how Eve actually does help God deliver the story of love with humanity. What are the different ways that you see that happening? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in how she cares for and nurtures her, her sons, there's not a lot explicit in the text, but the but Hebrew scholars ha- have spoken of this about how um, not only does she bring Cain and Abel into life, right, creation, um, and partners with God in that, but how she nurtures and cares for them and mourns, uh, mourns for Abel and his death. Um, so I think there's, there's, a, there's a trope of this nurturing uh, parent from her um, that, that is, I think, helpful in the narrative. Well, and, and in, she's a parent to children, but she's also one of the first children, too. So mm-hmm. you see mm-hmm. her as actually, we, we think of, of Adam and Eve as these fully formed adult humans, I think, in the garden. And, and mm-hmm. I, I don't know, I, I don't know that it specifies one way or the other. We don't necessarily know the time frame on some of that, too. Mm-hmm. But, but in addition to Adam and Eve being the first parents, they are also the first children. And so you see Eve um, as as modeling some of for us what it means to grow up and what it means to discover and what it means to be curious. Uh, so so thinking about how God's story is delivered over time, God's story is delivered over time through curiosity, too. Or even if we just look at the Bible as narrative uh, up until the point where we see Eve acting is just God's action. And so Eve is one of the first human actors that moves the plot along as far as the narrative of scripture is concerned. Uh, and then that's huge because after that, we get this interaction and this dance of God's activity and human activity. Uh, but one of the first folks to actually contribute to the story through action is Eve. Right. Yeah. And we always kind of, if we go back to that, you know, Eve takes all the blame, Mm -hmm. you know, Eve's the first to disobey. Well, well, maybe actually Eve is the first to use the gift of free will Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe birthing humanity's continual, not struggle, but continual ability that God has given us out of love Mm -hmm. to make choices um, and to choose and to struggle and to wrestle and and for God to still be in the garden with them. Um, I, I don't know that I see that necessarily as a bad thing, no. but as a gift of using the blessing that God gave us. Yeah, right. Right. Eve, Eve right. becomes the first full human mm-hmm. because of that, because right. pushing back and rebellion and questioning and seeking and and utilizing our free will actually is part of our full humanity of the, right. the way that God created us. It's it's often framed as this negative, sinful thing, and, right. and yet it's also still part of the image of God in us. Right. right. And what parent doesn't want that, within reason, <laughs> 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 what parent doesn't want that from their child for their child to mm-hmm. figure out what it means to make those decisions by themselves and, and kind of work out, and like you said, explore mm-hmm. what it means mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. Right. So she's she's the 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 creator the 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 first human and or for fully human and the and the the first uh, the creator maybe of free will or the first one to live in uh, to free will which which that's just that's beautiful to think about um, that we're not tied to uh, like like a marionette puppet that we are you know, free and she lives into that 
for us. I, I'm interested, Jen and Jed. Jeremy and I do not have children. Mm. Um, you both have children. Uh, where do, do you see this as being a struggle as a parent? Um, you know, Jeremy, it's easy for Jeremy and I to say, don't you want your children to push back and to exercise <laughs> their free will? Isn't right. that some of what you want? But I imagine that's also a struggle too. Yeah. Uh, I'd love for them to do it. I taught them to do it. And then when they did it, I was like, oh, maybe you should wait till you're you know, 30 years old, <laughs> not living with me anymore, yeah. which, which again speaks to that. Like I, I, we, we've talked about this before, the intensity of God and God's love to be able to choose to create mm-hmm. and give this gift of free will mm-hmm. and then allow us to use it right. as much as when my, my kids choose their own way and, and struggle and wrestle, like you said, Melissa, and it breaks my heart. How much more does it break God's heart? But God loves us and wanting us to be still in relationship, which we yeah. see. In yeah. That. Yeah. I never thought of this about this as a theological statement. <laughs> but, um, you know, when my kids go off, when, when they drive away to work or go to school, we, we always say, you know, we love you. Make good choices. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think that's right. that's in the line of, of what God is saying to Adam and Eve and uh, make good choices. Um, and and tell them like, at the beginning, yeah. like, here's the garden. Here's the here's the tree you don't eat, which in essence is saying, I mean, when you say don't do something, mm-hmm. you're in essence just <laughs> offering the choice you, to the person. You have pointed out the big red button. <laughs> right. Here's exactly. the big red button. Just don't press the big red button. It's the easiest <laughs> thing in the world. Right. 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 I really want to press that big button. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think it's beautiful, too, because in essence, I think she births our struggle. She names our struggle for humanity, mm-hmm. that we are always... You know, the tree represents having the knowledge that is the same as God. Mm -hmm. And we are always trying to be the creator Mm -hmm. instead of doing the creating alongside the creator. Mm -hmm. And and that's the ultimate struggle. I mean, she births for us the ultimate problem Mm -hmm. that we have or the ultimate choice, I would say, that we have in life that each and every one of us struggles with. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. couple of years ago, we we had Children of Eden was one of our shows yes. here. And it part of that story, the first half of that story is creation and the creation of the first humans and and their struggle and their relationship with God in the garden. And I, I love how Eve is portrayed. Um, Lily Thomas did such a beautiful job portraying her in that show because you see this this. Um, this really just this curiosity, but in the show, the the song that keeps coming back with her is the spark of creation. Mm-hmm. The idea that that her curiosity and her struggle and her um, seeking and her you know need to push and pull and to to challenge and to push the big red button sometimes and to grab the fruit and whatever it might be is part of the spark, the divine spark in yes. us, and that that is so counterintuitive for. Those of us who have just grown up with the mythology of, of Adam and Eve and the mythology right. of, of this, instead of really digging into the, the scripture itself to understand that that is the spark of creation, that mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we're not seeing a story of, of a negative, sinful, awful thing. We're seeing a story of humanity, of, mm-hmm. of the fullness of who we have actually been created to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that brings us to the whole Advent word of love. I mean, this is a story of love. And and the truth is that gift of free will and that curiosity, you're right. It's the spark of divine creation in us. Mm-hmm. And, and God, yes, there is a punishment we see at the end of, of this moment. Right. But it's it's really the consequences. It's the consequences of... Of, of when when you get mixed up between who am I am I the creator or the creating the divine the divine image in us is always creating we're called to be co-creators that's mm-hmm. why God made us mm-hmm. out of love mm-hmm. but the but the end result is yeah we get mixed up but God is with us God sews us clothes God mm-hmm. goes mm-hmm. with us from the garden God goes with us into our lives and mm-hmm. I think that's one of the way this is a love story yeah but mm-hmm. what do y'all think no, you summarized my thoughts quite well. <laughs> that that um, that there are consequences for all of our choices, the good choices we make and the bad choices we make, yeah. and that God is ever present. I mean, the story doesn't doesn't stop there, mm-hmm. right? Humanity, human life, Adam and Eve aren't just then killed. 
Mm -hmm. um, they they now know the full spectrum of good and evil, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of spectrum language in the That's creation right. story, and 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 now we're aware that there are consequences between all of it, mm -hmm. um, and yet God is still present. Mm -hmm. God is not abandoning human humanity. God doesn't abandon Eve, and and I think that's out of out of out of deep deep divine love. And you continue to see. So this story starts a series of stories where throughout, particularly the Old Testament, but you can go all the way through of, of where, where humanity rebels or complains or pushes back or, or whatever it might be. And God, and in the same way that, that Adam and Eve have this moment and God provides clothes and God provides food and God provides, you know, companionship and all of those different things mm -hmm. you see, um, in the wilderness, God provides manna. And then when they get tired of the manna, God provides quail. And then, I mean, and eventually will the spoilers to the end of Advent, hmm. God provides Jesus. Oh. Right. Um, <laughs> So, so you see, it, it really is kicking off and showing us from the very beginning God's love that is going to drive every other story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That the continual love story between God and humanity is God's story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that what you were saying before presents this really interesting idea. So we, we do, once again, look at the story's narrative and think about the tension of being these finite beings, these first original finite beings, right? With this divine spark and having that balance of, I can create, but I'm not the ultimate creator. And what is the, what is the, the, the space between this ultimate creator and myself and my mm -hmm. ability to create? That's a really tangled idea to work out. You know what I mean? And so how dare we put so much pressure on the first humans for not knowing how to human. Right. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, There's like no instruction one, manual, right? right? exactly. Yeah. You and, can't and, Google that. And I'm thankful that we have a guy that knew that, knows that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, 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 and sees our human experience as begun by Eve, as this experiment and as this exploration to figure it out. Yeah. To figure out how to live in our divine spark alongside the ultimate creator, right. the all-determining reality that is God, you know? Well, it's funny you said that you would think by now we would have figured out how to human better, and I'm not sure no, that's no. the case. No, because we still, <laughs> out of love, still have the spark of creativity and the mm -hmm. spark of divine image within us. Yeah. And the question is, who do we submit to with that? Mm -hmm. Who do, do we submit to God, which is a, a, a relationship that has to build and trust with one another so mm -hmm. that that what we are creating is a is is a mark of God's will and God's divine and God's beauty and God's creativity, or do we submit to to ourselves and the world and and use and still use that spark of divine creativity, mm -hmm. but we use it for other things, right? Right. Um, and that's where the rub is, um, and that and and just so we're clear again, we don't believe in Wesleyan tradition that the divine spark is ever taken away from right, us, right. that the image of God is ever taken away from us, mm -hmm. even, and we see that in this story. Right. And I think that's one of the main reasons why this is the story of love. Yeah. I, I yeah. always say it's important, the order of the two creation stories in Genesis, because in the first creation story, the first thing that is said about humanity is humanity is good. Mm -hmm. We see that story and we supremely see that good. supremely, supremely good. good as we tell it confirmation. We see that before we see this story of humanity struggling mm -hmm. and the goodness comes before the struggle, which means the goodness still exists in the struggle. Mm -hmm. The goodness is probably actually part of the struggle. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we see, we, 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 the collective sort of, you know, a lot of churches, a lot of Christian culture talks about those as being in opposition when actually they're all part of the same divine right. spark. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that speaks to a problem of thought I think we have today where we really reject nuance. Right. For some reason, we don't believe that two things can be true at the same time, that that there can be a distance from something or that. Maybe uh, God does uh, send uh, Adam and Eve out in this narrative to experience life in a different space. But at the same time, they retain that goodness. Right. Uh, we see that in, in all kinds of uh, in all kinds of ideas just in our, in our public sphere. And I think it's, it's important for us to see that in, within ourselves mm -hmm. um, to to 
under except God's love. And we're talking about love here too, with with Eve and birthing all of this and creating this this understanding that that we are not totally deprived. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. after the expulsion from the garden, you know, there is still goodness in these people. There is still divineness in these people. And and then for for us today to hear that, um, to hear that that uh, we're in this line of Eve. Um, there are consequences, and yet God is still present. There are consequences, and God's love is still greater than those consequences. Uh, God's presence is still here. So much so that what we're going to see over the next three weeks is the fact that even when the world th- tries to stop that story, God continues to follow us in love and yeah. chase us in love and yeah. go, we're going to get this. We're going to get this one day. You're going to see yeah. that that we're going to get this, and that love does win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. So- I think that wraps us up for Eve before we get, get going into our, our next three weeks. I, I, we're so thankful for you all joining us as we kick off Advent together uh, with our week at St. Luke's. Um, and we are excited to go on this Advent journey this year. So we'll see you next week as we talk about Sarah and how she helps us see Advent joy. 